All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Just Infrastructures speaker series. And for those returning, welcome back. My name is Indy Gupta, and along with Anita Chan and Carrie Karaholios, my fellow co-leads of the Just Infrastructures Initiative, we will be your hosts for today's event. We will be live tweeting today's event using the hashtag Just Infrastructures. That's with a capital J and a capital I. Again, that's hashtag Just Infrastructures. You can live tweet too with that hashtag. And for those of you who don't know us yet, Just Infrastructures is an initiative created by researchers to interrogate the complex interactions between people, algorithms, and AI-driven systems. You can learn more about us and see more information about our next event with Suresh Venkat on April 7th at our website at just-infras.illinois.edu. A link has been added to the chat and you can see our full spring calendar of talks there too. We would like to thank our funders and sponsors, the Computer Science Department, the School of Information Sciences, the Granger College of Engineering's SRI program, Capital One, and the Community Data Clinic for supporting this programming. We also have a long list of non-financial co-sponsors you can see on our website, and we would like to thank them as well. To ask a question, please use the Q&A box. We'll go through the questions at the very end of the talk. Closed captioning and American Sign Language support is also available. Please use the chat to request any tech support and a note that this talk is being recorded. I'd like to now ask you to join me in the land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists and the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands it is located. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Ottawa, Salk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasha nations. This acknowledgement demonstrates commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here? And how can we be accountable to our part in history? A reminder again that we will be live tweeting today's event on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag Just Infrastructures, capital G and capital I. You can live tweet with that hashtag too. We now like to turn it over to our esteemed presenter. We are extremely honored to have Dr. Ranveer Chandra with us here today. Ranveer is the CTO of AgriFood and also chief scientist of Microsoft Azure Industry and managing director of the Research for Industry Initiative at Microsoft Research. Ranveer's research has included farm beats, battery technology, and TV white spaces. His work has shipped in multiple Microsoft products, including Xbox, Azure, Windows, and Visual Studio. Bill Gates featured Ranveer's farm beats work on Gates Notes, and Ranveer has presented his work to the Secretary of Agriculture and the FCC Chairman. Ranveer is an IEEE Fellow and appeared on the MIT Technology Review's Top Innovators Under 35 list in 2010. He has published over 90 research papers and has over 100 patents. Ranveer has an undergraduate degree from IIT Kharagpur in India and a PhD in computer science from Cornell University. And on a more personal note, I have followed Ranveer's work over the past few decades and I absolutely love his exquisite taste for new areas as well as his penchant for being at the forefront of research that lies at the interface of infrastructure and society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ranveer Chandra. The floor is yours, Ranveer. Thank you. Thank you, Indy and uh, Anita and Carrie. It's been a, it's a pleasure to be here talking at University of Illinois Just Infrastructure Series. I would have loved to be there in person, but we'll keep that for next time. So uh, today I'll talk about a work that I have been doing for the last uh, six years. And I have worked with several collaborators. Uh, I'll be presenting work of several students, several interns, several engineers with whom I worked. On this, on this initiative called Farm Beats. So the goal of Farm Beats is to help solve the world's food problem. As many of you know, the world has a food problem. That is, we have, uh, the world needs more food to feed the growing population of the world. 
it's not just about growing more food. We need to grow good food. We need to give people nutritious food. And we need to grow this additional nutritious food without harming the planet. So the key question is how do we get there? How do we get to this goal of sustainably feeding the world or nourishing the world? One of the most, one of the most promising approaches to get there is that of data-driven agriculture. What we mean by data-driven agriculture, one of the applications as well, you could then map every farm in the world and you could overlay it with data. This is just one of the examples. And if you did this, if you could create maps like this of every farm, accurate maps, say for example, soil moisture, soil temperature, soil nutrients, soil pH, you could then use it to enable techniques such as precision agriculture. With precision agriculture, what we mean is that if you had such a map, you could then do site-specific application of inputs. You could apply, you could plant seeds only with, where, where, at, the, at the right spacing. You could apply water only where it is needed, when it is needed, where it is needed. Same with nutrients, same with pesticides. And precision agriculture has been shown to improve yields. It can help plants grow better. It has been shown to reduce cost because you use less of the inputs less water, less pesticide. It's also better for the environment because for the same reasons, you're not wasting water, you're not wasting, uh, wasting chemicals. In fact, this is just one part of the entire data-driven agri-food vision. If you, could if you could collect data from the entire supply chain, that is all the way from input companies to farmers, to co-ops, to food processing companies, every component in the food supply chain they could start capturing data and start taking data-driven decisions. For example, I talked about a farmer using precision agriculture. Food processing companies could use this data to make this food processing better. Food distribution companies could use this data to improve their logistics operations. In fact, if you could start sharing the data across the entire food supply chain, this could then enable new efficiencies, new business models. For example, it, for example, for traceability, consumers are more and more asking about how the food was grown. This is also important for food safety scenarios. You want to know how the food was grown in the first place. For precision agriculture scenarios, I talked about how exchanging this data, sharing this data across the entire supply chain. For example, a digital advisory company getting data about seeds, getting data about what farm management practices a farmer uses. And similarly for sustainable farming, a lot of discussions are going on around uh, farmers being, being reimbursed for using the right agricultural practices. But in order to do that, you need to share data from the farm, from the, uh, from the equipment companies, from the input companies and gather all of that data in order to enable all of these business models. In fact, despite the benefits of data-driven agriculture and data-driven agri-food systems, and this has been shown in the past, these systems haven't really taken off. And one of the biggest reasons these systems haven't taken off, despite us knowing the benefits, is the cost of these digital solutions, of these data-driven agriculture solutions. And this led to the start of the Farm Beats project back in, uh, in 2015. So before I get into the details, I wanted to let you, let you all know that I am not an agriculture scientist. My background, my training is as a computer scientist. But growing up, I spent a lot of time in my grandparents' farm in India. As it happens, if there are Indians on the call, they can relate to this. As you grow, like we, when growing up, we spend a lot of time with our grandparents. Uh, every summer and winter vacation, I would go to, to the farms. This was in North Bihar, uh, Bihar for people who don't know, this is a state in Northern India. So I would go to these farms. Back then, I did not like anything to do with agriculture. That is these farms, they did not have electricity, they did not have toilets, yet I spent a lot of time in these farms. And that is what, uh, even though I did not like this, this the, the, the summer and winter vacations, it, this, this time exposed me to a lot of poverty and a lot of primitive forms of agriculture in those parts of the world. And that is what drove me to start this particular project, Farm Beats. And the goal of this project when we started was to bring down the cost of these data-driven agriculture solutions by two orders of magnitude. That is to this particular problem that I have on this slide, 
Can you significantly bring down the cost to make data-driven agriculture, digital agriculture, more affordable for farmers worldwide? And I'll talk about a few ways in which we are innovating to help address that problem. So the first reason existing solutions are expensive is because of the cost of connectivity. The farmer's house, especially if you're looking at the developed world, has some sort of connectivity to the cloud. However, the farm is a few miles away. Sometimes even though connectivity might exist when you plant the seeds, by the time the crops grow, the connectivity is gone. So then the question is, how can you transmit data from the middle of the farm to the farmer's house? To address this problem, we use uh, a prior research in which I have been working on since 2005 called the TV white spaces. What the TV white spaces enables is imagine if you have a Wi-Fi router that you could access several miles away. That would be cool, right, if you could do that. The way we did that was we took a Wi-Fi signal and we put it in empty TV channels. This is over-the-air TV. This is TV you watch using antennas. You know, when you browse through TV on certain channels, you get a transmission. On the other channels, all you see is white noise. The technology we had developed was a way to take a Wi-Fi signal and put it in these empty TV channels in a way that doesn't interfere with your TV reception in an adjacent channel. So you could be watching channel seven at home on channel eight, we could be sending Wi-Fi signals. So the kind of scenario this would enable is imagine if every, every grower, every farmer in the house or office would mount one of these antennas and then get broadband connectivity in the miles around that farm. So the, the, the reason this is so cool for agriculture is that TV towers are where people are. TV towers are in Chicago, in New York. The farms are typically away from the cities. So if you turn on a TV in the middle of a farm, most of these channels are white noise. And the more noisy channels there are, the more available spectrum there is. So even if there are uh, 20 TV channels that are available, and I'm being conservative here, each TV channel is six megahertz wide, you're talking of 120 megahertz of available spectrum. That is a lot of capacity, like half a gigabit per second of capacity that you could, you could then bring in to the middle of the farm. So this is one of the innovations that we have, uh, that, that we came up with in our system. By the way, when I talk about TV white spaces, the, uh, the FCC, so this was a technology that we've been working on for quite a while. In 2010, the FCC chairman had come to the Microsoft campus to see the demo we had put together. It was actually made legal in 2010. And very recently in October of last year, the FCC passed new regulations, making the TV white spaces even more uh, attractive for remote connectivity. And this is something that we are continuing to push on to see how you could use this technology to bring broadband to rural parts of the world. One of the key reasons this is also attractive is that compared to Wi-Fi at the same power level, in UHF TV channels, your signals go four times farther. In VHF, they go 12 times farther. And this is in free space. Once you put in trees, crops, canopies, your signals just keep going through. So with this, we believe we can address one of the hard hardest problems uh, that is blocking the digital transformation of agriculture, which is connectivity. One of the other reasons existing solutions are expensive is because of the cost of building maps. For example, I had talked about a map like this before. Suppose you, have, you want to build an accurate map for a farm. Say, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? If you have to build an accurate map like this, you would need lots and lots of sensors. Say, it's, uh, for, for soil moisture, for example, you would need a sensor every 10 meters. But putting a sensor every 10 meters is expensive to deploy, to manage, it will come in the way of the farmer as the farmer does their day-to-day -day job. So the key question we asked then was, can we build a map like this using very few sensors? Our key idea to solve this problem was to use aerial imagery in conjunction with sensors. So we use aerial imagery, say from drones. These drones have a camera at the bottom. They can cover large areas very quickly. If you don't have drones, which might be a challenge for smallholder farmers, we use a helium filled balloon, which is like four or five feet in diameter to which you can attach a smartphone and you can take, take images of the farm using that. If you have neither a balloon or a drone, 
we use aerial imagery from satellites. Once you get this image of a farm, then what we do is based on carefully placed sensors in the farm, we use that to train an AI machine learning model. The way it works is wherever you have a sensor and the corresponding aerial imagery, not just RGB, but multispectral or hyperspectral imagery, we use that to train an AI machine learning model and then use that model to predict these values in other parts of the farm where you do not have sensors. Like for example, and we did this for soil temperature, soil pH and soil moisture, and we are continuing to do this for, uh, for other parameters as well. The interesting question we came up with though was once we were looking at, uh, once we started getting aerial imagery, one of the challenges we realized was that existing satellites, they can't see through clouds in satellite imagery. At any instant in time, 77% of the earth has clouds. If you have clouds, you really can't see what's happening underneath it. So to see this, we came up with another, uh, another technique, another uh, invention. This was developed by one of our interns from MIT. He came up with this technology called SpaceEye. And the key idea here is to use data from another satellite that goes around the Earth that has radar in it. These are radio frequency signals that go through the clouds and they reflect differently from different services. And then we came up with an AI model that uses the SAR in conjunction with the optical imagery to reconstruct the optical imagery below the clouds. And we use this technology on the left, what you're seeing is the, uh, the current images that you get. And on the right is what space I can generate. On a daily basis, we are able to generate cloud-free imagery, which we then use for interpolation using the te technique I described earlier. So with TV white spaces, we can bring down the cost of connectivity with the AI scheme, we need much fewer sensors than what you would otherwise need to build accurate maps of the farm. One of the other challenges was that, well, you, a lot of data from the farm can be captured to the farmer's house, but the farmer's house, the connectivity from the farmer's house to the cloud is weak. Most farmers, they pay for broadband, but all they get is one to three megabits per second of connection. In fact, there are farms. There was a farm in upstate New York where we were looking at deploying this technology. Every time there was a snowstorm, there was a high likelihood that his internet connection would go off. So then the question is, if you're collecting large amounts of data from the farm, but you can't send it to the cloud, how would you get the benefits of all of this data to the farmer? To address this problem, we, our key insight was that most, grow, most farmers, they have a PC. If they don't have a PC, we ship them a PC form factor device that sits in the farmer's house or office and does a lot of compute sitting in the farmer's house or office. This IoT device, this is an edge device. This is where we run a lot of computer vision and ML algorithms, just double clicking on what's running on the edge device. Everything you're seeing in, this, uh, in the big gray box on this slide is running on that PC. It gets data from sensors, from drones, from uh, uh, from cameras. It does a lot of computer vision algorithms, generates 3D point clouds. It does the uh, orthomosaic algorithms, runs on the edge as well. And then we run all the agricultural services that are the, what you're seeing on the right could also be run on the same device. And then each of the boxes here are running in containers. What that means is that you can easily move it between if you have great connectivity to the cloud, you don't need to be running all of this on the edge device. You could move some of these containers to the cloud and run it in the cloud. However, if you don't have great connectivity, you could be running all of it on the edge device as well. All of this data is lazily synced with the cloud. And that's where we have added, added some intelligence as well. Like for example, every time you fly a drone, you could be generating several gigabytes of data in a 15 minute drone flight. And rather than sending the entire gigabytes of data to the cloud, some of the new technologies we built is a way to, in, to find out what are the more important parts of the images, extract those parts, and come up with an intelligent compression scheme so that you transfer the more important parts of the image to the cloud first. In addition to that, the edge has a, a web server so that it can be accessed offline. It also has storage where all of that data is available on the edge device. So this is a technology that was in research. We did deployed this in multiple farms in different parts of the world, anywhere from a farm from 
of 0.5 acres to a much bigger farm of 9,000 acres. And I'll talk about a few use cases of how people are using uh, this technology. So one of the scenarios we built was uh, microclimate forecasting. What we enable with this is a grower can then put a sensor in the farm. Once you put the sensor in the farm connected over an IoT TV white spaces link, we not only tell the grower what the sensor values are right now or what it has been in the past, we, come up with, we came up with a new algorithm to start predicting what these sensor values would be in the future. Like, as you know, right, for growing climate and like weather predictions are a key component for a farmer, a key parameter for a farmer to take their farming decisions. However, when a farmer looks at the predicted weather forecast, what they get is the weather forecast at the weather station, which could be very different from the weather forecast in the farm. What we did was came up with a new, uh, a new machine learning algorithm to make these hyperlocal weather predictions. The way we did this was we took weather station data from about 50 weather stations across Washington state over the last seven years. We used this data, this is at every 15 minute interval, we use this data to train an, an, a machine learning model. And then once you put in a new sensor in a farm, we then use transfer learning to start making very hyper-local predictions of what might be happening in the farm. And over time we learned and make that model better. And over here, what you're seeing are these predictions in these graphs, if you look at the red, red bar for soil temperature and soil moisture, even up to five days in advance, the error in the prediction is less than 10%. And we deployed this in, in a farm and there is this farmer in, in Eastern Washington. He farms, uh, he farms 9,000 acres spread across 45 miles. And every time he takes his tractor off, his, his tractor out, because it's spread across 45 miles, his farm, he would be spending quite a lot of time out in the farm. Every time he, he takes his tractor out, he consults a forecast to see what the wind is going to be in different parts of the farm. Because once you're spraying any chemicals, you want to make sure it's going at the right spot. And with, with microclimate prediction, he can make the right decision. In fact, on the bottom left side of the screen, you're seeing another testimonial from, from him. He was looking to spray chemicals in his farm. This is herbicide in a small part of the farm where there were weeds. He looked at the weather forecast. The weather forecast said that temperature was going to be in the 40s. We predicted it was going to be uh, 31 degrees. It was actually 30 degrees. It was below freezing. It was good he didn't go and spray, spray chemicals in the farm, in that part of the farm, because otherwise he would have lost his crop. This is another scenario I like talking about. This is a farm in upstate New York. This is a four kilometer stretch. The farmer wanted to know how his farm, how his cows were doing once they were out in pasture. So we flew the drone, we transmitted the data over the white spaces to an edge device, which was running in the farmer's house. We used computer vision algorithms to generate this, this 3D point cloud, this image. And then for this farm, within 30 minutes, we could start flagging things like, there is a water puddle that needs to be fixed before the next planting season. The cows are pooping well, which was also important information for the farmer. This is deep learning on cow poop. This is where the cows are. Uh, this is a stray cow that needs to be herded in. All of this within 30 minutes of flying the drone. There is another farm close to Microsoft campus where we do, uh, we used to do a lot of demos. Uh, this is where we hosted Bill Gates. We hosted several people in this farm to showcase what technology can bring to a grower. For this farmer, we showed him these beautiful pictures about his farm. We also overlaid this with data. For example, here what you're seeing is a soil moisture map where we were able to flag that the bottom left part of the farm is moist, even though we did not have a sensor over there. This is a soil pH map. After the farmer had applied lime, we were able to flag that the dark parts of the farm are still acidic and the farmer needs to reapply lime before planting the seeds. These were all using the, uh, the interpolation mechanism I talked about, that is using ground sensor data plus aerial imagery. And in the paper we wrote, we showed that this scheme is up to three times more accurate than existing schemes that did not use aerial imagery to build these maps. This is again the farm in upstate New York where we, sh we, we have multiple cameras in a barn and we transfer this data to an edge device where we are seeing where the cows are, where the cows are moving well, whether a cow is sick and all of that information and flag that to the grower. If you look at the previous scenario, it's obvious that without having 
inexpensive connectivity and edge compute, it becomes hard to, to realize a lot of these scenarios for agriculture. So this was all in research when we were doing deployments. And then uh, we moved over uh, to the product side. This was about uh, two and a half years back. And then we, we shipped some of this, the first, the very first version of this as part of Azure Farm Beats. As you're, uh, uh, like, as you know, many of the ag tech solutions right now, there are several ag tech companies. What they do is they gather data from different data streams. No one really does all of them, but they try to get all of this data streams, get it to the cloud, store it in the cloud, and then they add additional AI on top of it to enable multiple ag tech applications. This is most of the pipeline right now. As part of Azure Farm Beats, what we did was we took some of these components and we are realizing it as part of an Azure Farm Beats stack. So we are partnering with companies, we are partnering with weather companies, with satellite companies, with drone companies, farm equipment companies, and we're enabling all of this data to come in to the cloud and then once they get to the cloud, we are also providing a way to bring artificial intelligence on top of it, bringing some of these AI ML tools on top of FarmBeats. And once we do that, we then enable a, farm, a partner ISV ecosystem that can take a lot of these solutions to the growers. As I was saying, a lot of FarmBeats depends on the data streams that we could bring in. We've partnered with several companies. You're seeing some of them here that we've talked about in the past for DTN being some of the one of the latest partners that we work with, which is a weather provider, where the vision of what we have with Farm Beats is you can then plot a piece of land, you could just mark a polygon in for any field or plot or farm. And then what we do is for that polygon, we bring in data from different data streams, from satellite data to weather data to farm equipment data, drone data, sensor data. We bring all of that data for that polygon in one place do the geospatial transformations on top of it. And then we, we make the data more analysis ready for a lot of your AI workloads on top so that you can then start writing your AI components on top and bringing these AI solutions to the market. So our goal with all of this is we are not farmer facing in the sense that farm beats the way we are taking it to market is not a farmer facing product. It is a product for other agricultural businesses to build the solutions on top. And that is what we have done with several partnerships that we've announced over the last year. For example, with Lando Lakes, we announced a partnership on Farm Beats where Lando Lakes is building the digital agriculture solutions on top of Azure Farm Beats. This includes for, for, uh, for, uh, this includes, uh, for outdoor crops, for, for livestock, and even for sustainability scenarios. Similarly, with USDA Agricultural Research Service, we announced uh, the partnership with Farm Beats where researchers are using this data to build AI models, to understand cover cropping and the benefits of cover cropping for, for growers. So in addition to the product side of thing, and on the product side, we are continuing to make a product better, more scalable, faster, and adding new, uh, new capabilities on top of Azure Farm Beats. In addition to that, we are taking a step further beyond research and products we are continuing to take the solutions and drive solution and drive more societal impact. And I'll talk about a few of those uh, scenarios that we're developing at Microsoft. One of the initiatives at Microsoft is Airband, where uh, through, the, through the Airband initiative, we are working on bringing uh, broadband to rural com com communities. The way we are doing that is we are licensing the technologies, we are providing grants, we are creating these ISP and strategic partnerships and we're working with several stakeholders to bridge the rural broadband gap. In fact, we've made a pledge that by 2022, we'd be connecting 3 million rural Americans to broadband using this technology. And one of the core uh, enabling components of Airband is TV white spaces, although we are also bringing other technologies such as uh, CBRS, private LTE, or even space connectivity to, uh, to, uh, to rural communities in the US and other parts of the world. One of the other uh, initiatives we announced last year, we made a big carbon commitment. That is Microsoft has made a pledge that by 2030, we are going to be carbon negative. And by 2050, we are going to re be removing all the carbon emissions that we've ever generated since the time Microsoft was founded. And this is a huge commitment. We've also set a, a billion dollar climate innovation fund in order to get to our goals. 
The thing is, how do we get there? How do we even get to our carbon negative goal by 2030? Part of how we'll get there is by reducing our own emissions. We are going to be making our data centers more efficient, our, our products, uh, the scope one, two, and three emissions of our products much lesser, but that's not going to be enough. We are going to be investing in other ways, in other technologies to put carbon back into soil. So for carbon, one way to understand it is that this, these carbon gases above the ground is bad and below the ground is good. And we have to look at ways to put more and more of this carbon back into soil. The interesting thing about agriculture is that one of the ways you could put this carbon back in soil is using farming. Like as you know, plants, trees, due to photosynthesis, they capture carbon and they spit out carbon, oxygen. And this carbon could go down to the roots. If you use the right agricultural practices, this carbon can stay in soil. Like for example, if you use uh, cover cropping, if you use uh, no-till or reduced till these are all different ways in which you could, you could enable more carbon to be put back in soil. And agriculture is one way in which we can make that happen. So we, last year we announced a one of its kind carbon RFP in which we had uh, many, uh, uh, many applicants to the carbon RFP. We did decide to buy carbon and we had two of these sources from where we are buying carbon, which are soil carbon agriculture based, for example, with land lakes. One of the other initiatives we are doing is with the FFA, with the Future Farmers of America. We've announced a partnership. We've created a Farm Beat student kit. We've created a curriculum around it. This is work we've done uh, through the Microsoft Philanthropies. And our goal here is to address the rural skill gap. And uh, we've created the student kit along with the curriculum so that students at these FFA high school chapters can learn about technology, learn about AI, and learn about data-driven agriculture while they are in school. In fact, we started this initiative in, uh, in 2018 where we had a competition where a few hundred high schools applied to the winning high schools. We gave them two of these Farm Beach student kits. More recently, we've modified these student kits to be even lower cost, and we partnered with the FFA and with a few of these, uh, these, these FFA chapters to start building the curriculum and to, to bring the latest in AI, to bring the latest in data to the students in these remote communities around in the US. One of the other recent work we did was with universities. We partner closely with various universities. We, we partner with Cornell, we partner with University of Illinois, uh, in, with, 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 with the agriculture and, and the computer science departments and NCSA. One of the recent work we did was with Purdue during COVID. With Purdue, what we did was, uh, there, was uh, there was issues around food supply uh, and the food supply chain getting disrupted during COVID-19. So what we did was we started two initiatives. One of them was we created a portal, what you're seeing on the left here, to connect smallholder farmers to consumers. As you know, during COVID, a lot of the smallholder farmers, they did not know how, where to sell their products, their produce. The restaurants were closed, schools were closed, hotels weren't as occupied. And many of these smallholder farmers felt this disruption. What we did was we worked with Purdue University to create a portal for these farmer market makers so that these farmer market makers could then connect the farmers to the consumers. In another work we did, what you're, what you're seeing on the right was with Professor Jason Lusk, who is the head of agriculture economics at Purdue University. We created a food and ag worker risk dashboard where for any commodity, you could then see for different states, like for example, for, for apples or for chicken, you could then see across for different states what is the likely disruption for that commodity in that particular state? In one scenario, for example, for a meat packing plant closure in Yakima, we were able to see the numbers go up even a week before that plant, uh, that packing plant actually closed. So at Microsoft, what we're doing is we're working on the entire stack of agriculture, all the way from research to products, to taking it all the way to create direct societal impact. And a lot of what we do is driven by working with the partners in the entire agribusiness ecosystem, all the way from uh, partners who, who are data providers to partners who could build solutions on top to uh, partners who are taking these solutions, these digital data-driven agriculture solutions to the growers in different part of the world. Now to bring it back, uh, one of the things I mentioned was 
that my personal passion behind all of this is to enable digital agriculture for farmers worldwide. And around the world, there are over half a billion smallholder farmers. By smallholder farmers, I mean these are farmers that farm less than one hectare, like less than 2.5 acres. So the question then is for these, even though with what I talked about previously, a lot of this would work for most farms that are tens of acres or more, for these smallholder farmers, we need to do more in order to get the benefits of digital agriculture to these smallholder farmers. And so to, to solve this problem, one of the work we're we continuing to work on ways to significantly bring down the cost of solutions and make it more affordable for smallholder farmers worldwide. In fact, I recently wrote a paper with the Gates Foundation, with, uh, with Stuart Collis at the Gates Foundation. It will appear at the in the communications of the ACM in, uh, in the coming months. And as part of this, we looked at what are the fundamental problems that are limiting the adoption of digital agriculture for smallholder farmers and how can we address them? So here, what you're seeing in this figure is the typical pipeline. This was this work was done um, in, uh, this was in Agra's 2017 uh, Africa Ag, Sta Ag, Ag Status Report. And over here, what you're seeing is a typical life cycle of how we want these smallholder farmers, how do we improve the livelihood of these smallholder farmers in emerging markets? So one of the things we did as part of this exercise of writing this paper was we went through this, uh, we went through different technologies, digital technologies that people have developed for smallholder farmers. Some of them could be built on top of farm leads right now. And we created this digital hype curve. If you're looking at this curve from left, you have this innovation trigger, you have this, this was, uh, this was uh, a burst done by Gartner, where you have this peak of inflated expectations, you have a trough of disillusionment, then you get this slope of enlightenment before it, this really takes off. And we plotted multiple of these technologies that exist into, into where they are in this entire hype curve. As you can see, most of these technologies are gravitating towards this trough of disillusionment and are yet to take off. Then one of the things we did as part of this exercise of writing this paper is we looked at what are the key reasons that these technologies are not yet taking off? What are these key bottlenecks that we need to address? And we came up with four of these bottlenecks. One, you need to make these systems more affordable. You need to make it more inexpensive so that growers, smallholder farmers can use it as well. The second challenge was that you need to get relevant data. There is large amounts of data coming in, but not as much good data that can be used to, to drive these digital agriculture solutions. When I talk of digital agriculture, it includes things like market linkages, finance, all of that. The third challenge was that of connectivity. I talked a little bit about it with TV white spaces, but that's still one of the technologies. We need to do more to bring internet to remote parts of the world. Just to, just to highlight how big this problem is, more than 40%, more than around 40% of the world still doesn't have internet access. And if you look at it, it's not because there is no wireless signal reaching these, these population. But the bigger challenge is that this even like more than around 90% of the people have some sort of connectivity that they could connect to if they had the money. It's just not affordable. So if we talk about 3 billion people not being connected to the internet and more than around 2 billion of them, it can not connect because it's just not affordable. And many of them are smallholder farmers. And the final challenge is that of usability. Many of these, uh, many of these growers, they, uh, uh, they are not tech savvy. So how do you even present data to them so that they can use any of the digital agriculture advisories is one of the four problems. So the problems being affordability, relevant data, connectivity, and usability. There are more that we list out in the paper, but at a high level, these are some of the challenges. And to address some of the challenges, we need unique solutions. Existing techniques as is won't work. Like one of the things that we have been working on at Microsoft is a way to, to make these, this technology more affordable, make sensing more affordable. The key problem here was that, you know, if you look at, if you want to buy a sensor for your farm, these sensors 
still cost a, a few hundred dollars, if not a thousand dollars, say a soil moisture plus soil EC electrical conductivity sensor. And at that point, at a few hundred dollars for most farmers worldwide, it's unaffordable. They don't know what is the ROI, what is the return of investment of buying one of these expensive sensors and putting it in the farm. The key insight we had was that, well, most farmers, they won't spend a few hundred dollars for a sensor, but yet they, many of them have a smartphone, even if it is an inexpensive smartphone. If they have a smartphone, it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it. If it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it, the key idea was that to, if you could measure the time of flight of a Wi-Fi signal, you can then use it to estimate what the soil moisture and soil EC is, what the, the soil electrical conductivity. The key, the, the key insight behind this is just purely based on physics. That is, if you have a Wi-Fi, suppose you have a phone and it has a Wi-Fi chipset, the amount of time it takes to travel through soil when it is dry is much less than the amount of time it takes when the soil is moist. If you could measure this time, you can then use it to compute the permittivity and from that compute the soil moisture and soil electrical conductivity uh, uh, based on that. And of course, the challenge here is that this, this time is of the order of nanoseconds. And to measure that, uh, it's hard to do it with existing Wi-Fi chipsets. And that's why we came up with this idea of rather than measuring the absolute time of flight, you could use measure the relative time of flight because most of these Wi-Fi chipsets have multiple antennas. And we wrote a paper on this. Uh, this, this was with another intern from, uh, she's at Yale right now. And this paper got an award at ACM Mobicom, which is a top tier computer science conference. So we, this was one of the ideas, but of course, this is the first time we wrote this, uh, anyone has shown that Wi-Fi can be used to measure soil moisture and soil EC. We actually showed this to Bill Gates when he visited the farm to see farm beats. And he, in the article that he wrote in Gates Notes, the title of the article was, can the Wi-Fi chip in your phone help feed the world? That said, I would caveat it by saying that this is still research. Initial research, we need a lot more of it, a lot more research and product promotion around it to get it out there to be really usable by the wide population of farmers worldwide. And as I was saying with uh, Stuart, we actually went through this exercise and we looked at four different digital enabling methods, like on the each row here, you're seeing around sensors, satellites, robots, phones, ICT tech, data platforms. And each of the columns here are corresponding to the four key problems I talked about, which are limiting the adoption of digital agriculture for smallholder farmers around affordability, relevant data, connectivity, data platforms, and usability. And we then mapped it to essentially key computer science areas. If you're looking at ACM SIGARCH, that's hardware and architecture. If you're looking at, uh, 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 say, um, uh, say SIGCOM, which is SIGCOM, SIGOPS, is security and systems. You could be looking at, uh, uh, say, SIGCHI for human interface and same for AIML and, uh, and computer vision communities. And for each one of these, we plotted, we, we wrote down some of the hard problems that need to be solved at the, to, in order to address some of these problems and make digital agriculture for smallholder farmers more affordable. In fact, we took it a step further and looked at the maturity levels around each of these technologies right now. And as the, the ones in green are more mature than the others, the one in yellow are further ahead. They still need more work to, to, to really get it into the market. And the ones in red need a lot more innovation and disruption to take it, to make it, uh, uh, to make it uh, feasible for smallholder farmers worldwide. Some of the key takeaways, if you're looking at that from, from this slide are, well, if you're looking at the sensors column, they are further ahead, sensors and satellites. You'll probably start seeing more and more of these technologies for smallholder farmers. If you look at um, uh, drones, well, uh, even though drones and automation have a lot of potential, that's where a lot more research needs to be done to make it really feasible for smallholder farmers worldwide. And of course, if you're looking at the vision and AI column, they can make any of these technologies much more usable, enable a lot of scenarios for smallholder farmers. So with that, I wanted to uh, finish my talk and open it up for questions. Just to summarize, today I talked about a new, uh, some of the core technologies that we've developed that can enable a future of agriculture that's going to be more data-driven. 
than where it is right now, which is primarily driven by intuition and guesswork. And to enable that future, we have presented this technology called Farm Beats, where we are further ahead. We've, we are deploying, we are building products around it, but we're still scratching the surface of what truly can be achieved of a future of agriculture that is more profitable for farmers, better for the world, that they can grow good food, and also a future of the world which is more sustainable and enabling agriculture to play a key role to mitigate the impact of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Ranveer, for the wonderful and thought-provoking talk. Uh, we now have some time for audience questions. Uh, you can send us your questions via the Q&A box. Uh, we have some questions that are queued up. So Carrie Karaholius and I will moderate the questions and I'm gonna read aloud the first question from uh, the audience. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Claudia Grisales. Uh, she asks, thinking about just infrastructures in a global scale, have you considered the relationships between your innovations and other propositions to solve the world's so to solve the world's food problems like family agriculture, especially in the global south? No, that's a, that's a great point. And when we a lot of these smallholder farmers that we talk about and that we work with are subsistence farmers as well. They uh, they they are growing some of this food for themselves in addition to, and some of them would sell it. In, uh, sell it in the market and take it to the world. In fact, in the particular figure, this Agra report, where we talk about the evolution of the smallholder farmer, many of them start by being subsistence farmers. And the way you can improve their livelihoods is by both uh, allowing them to get new income sources, either by getting into more commercial farming or enabling them new opportunities to make money or helping them make their farming operations more profitable. But a lot of them start by subsistence farming, this family farming scenarios where they're growing a lot of the food that they grow. They start by having it for their own consumption before they take it for, uh, before they start selling it and starting to make money and making it part of their, uh, part of their livelihood. Um, the next question comes from Mohammed Huzaifa. Um, how do you convince farmers to use your work and are there non-technical challenges that you face during deployment? Yeah, there are several uh, non-technical challenges. We, we, you know, as technologists, we end up converting all of these to somehow to technology problems. Like, you know, one of the problems we ran into was affordability. Well, this is one of the core problems that how do you make things more affordable for growers? And part of it are, part of the solution is non-technology solutions. Like I talked about how you can build this low cost tech, but a big part of it has to be new business models, has to be new policy. Like one of the things that I like talking about is, well, you know how the government subsidizes agriculture or some of the agriculture equipment, like for example, it subsidizes seeds. If you go to India, for example, the government subsidizes seeds and inputs, fertilizers. What I believe is that the government should be subsidizing data-driven agriculture or digital agriculture as well. They should be subsidizing use of data. They should be subsidizing use of technology in the farm, which is a policy decision. How do you enable the right policies around it, not necessarily a technology problem. Then there are issues around farmer sharing data, around privacy, there is a trust issue. How do you enable farmers, how do you convince the farmers to, to share the data? I talked about in the slide how data sharing can enable a lot of new scenarios, but farmers are not comfortable sharing data, and many of them for the right reason. So how do you convince them to do that? Part of it is, again, a technology solution using cryptographic tools, but a lot of it is non-technology as well building the right programs to educate the growers on what and how they should share the data and how they can benefit from the data. So that again is another one, but there's a huge list of them, Carrie, and uh, these are just some of them top of my mind right now. Thank you. The next interesting question comes from Sean Kennedy, who asks, uh, will not this data-driven approach to agriculture eliminate the need for, rather than support, small farmers? <laughs> Good question. In fact, you know, when I uh, this is something I've been thinking about, and uh, I'll come to uh, I'll answer the question the way I think of it, and but there are many other interpretations of it, and I would love to have a longer discussion. So, you know, when I started the farm beats, one of the things I had done was I went and uh, I talked to farmers in different parts of the world, and I even volunteered on farms, spent a week 
uh, farming and planting seeds in like, for example, in this farm in upstate New York around this time, this was in 2015. And that, uh, what I learned from that experience was that uh, these farmers, one, they work hard, they really work hard. Their days start at 5 a.m. and ends at dusk, even after that, they keep working. The other thing I realized was that these farmers, they know a lot about their farm. Every farmer I met, and they have been farming there for several years, if not decades, maybe even generations. So these farmers, they know a lot about their farm. There was one farmer who could pick up the soil, feel the soil, and say what's going on. There was another farmer who would taste the soil and say what's going on. So these farmers know a lot about what's going on. Yet, a lot of decisions they took was based on guesswork. That is, they know a lot about their farm, yet when they plant the seed, when do they water, when do they harvest, when do they apply any, any fertilizer, where do they apply, is all based on guesswork and intuition. So the role of the goal when we started with Farm Beats was that, can you augment a farmer's knowledge with data and AI so that the farmer can then contextualize it in the context of their farm, which they understand a lot, and then take decisions which are appropriate for their farm. So it's not just one, one template fits all, but you could then use AI, data and AI to help a farmer or assist a farmer to take the right decisions. That's the vision of Farm Beats of what we are trying to do. In the future, you could say, well, you know what? You could, you could eliminate agriculture uh, farmers. You could just automate all of it with, with robots and drones. Why do you need farmers in the first place? Somehow I feel that there is a lot about agriculture that is, that it's the human aspect of it. Well, do you need doctors in the future? Well, you could have all of that automated. Maybe, who knows, right? Maybe that's the future of food. Somehow I would, uh, I would prefer to go to a human to, to test myself and same eat food that has that has a human element, which makes food that much more tastier, that much more nutritious. But, but that's a bet in the future, 50 years down the line, 100 years down the line, that who knows what the future is. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Vinay Koshi. Um, he asks, is it feasible for end users to set these systems up themselves or do they require expert installation? If they do require expert installation, what are the biggest challenges that prevent farmers from setting these systems up themselves and maintaining them? Yeah, so we work with multiple partners who are doing these deployments in, uh, in these farms. And there are quite a few out there, like Trimble, for example, they'll go and set up some of this equipment in the farm. You have these farm dealerships who are, um, who sell your equipment, who also maintain some of these. Of course, these add to costs, right? And if you're thinking of, uh, and that's why, even though these technologies are taking off in the developed world, they will take time to come up to it because each of these, each component that we add for maintenance or for, or for any other layer, any other component in the, in the pipeline, it will, add, it will make the system more expensive. But this is where we need new business models as well, rather than, rather than uh, buying these equipment, does renting the equipment make sense? So as a service model, so if someone runs digital agriculture as a service, comes and takes samples, comes and sets up sensors and takes a cut in the process. So we need some of these innovations to make it more affordable. The challenge with farmers setting it up, so farmers could definitely, they do. They, the good thing about, the other thing I learned about farmers is that they are not just an agriculture engineer, they are a, they are a techie as well. They are an electrical engineer, they are a mechanical engineer, they, they, they know everything. So they can, they, they are very hands-on, right? They know a lot about what's going on. Yet, a lot of this equipment requires the digital aspect of it, Le needs a digital literacy for the farmers, which is missing. And one of the other reasons this is missing is, is a problem we don't talk about much in agriculture, is that of the growing, growing age, the, the aging population of the farmers. Most of the next generation of farmers, they don't want to go back into agriculture. They'll go to cities, they'll go to do something else. So an average age of a farmer is continuously going up. And so the digital gap, the digital literacy of a farmer is also, uh, is, is, is not coming down. So that's one of the reasons why it's hard for a grower to start maintaining the entire digital pipeline. That's the reason, that's one of the blockers and that, that we've come across uh, when trying to, trying to enable more digital agriculture in rural parts of the world. Uh, the next question is from Elizabeth Koning who asks, how can farm beets or other approaches help address the problems of monocultures for more sustainable farming over the course of many years rather than just one growing season? 
Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a great point you mentioned, Elizabeth. That is most farmers, especially in the emerging markets, they look at the next season. They look at over the next season, what do I grow to make the most money? And this is what peep farmers have been doing over and over again. And the quality of soil has significantly degraded, especially if you look at the emerging markets. And for example, if you look at the nitrogen use efficiency or things like that in, in India, especially in places like Punjab, where the green revolution started, it created a lot of momentum there, but the soil quality has significantly degraded in those parts of the world because farmers are practicing monoculture. They grow wheat and over and over again, and the soil's really depleted. And I think uh, digital agriculture and policy both have a role to play to enable, to get these farmers away from monoculture, to enable them to practice more sustainable agriculture practices. Like one of the things digital agriculture tools can do is we can build what if tools. We can, we can empower a farmer to do what if analysis. What if I planted cover crops for my farm, for my soil type based on this cover crop, based on the weather prediction, how is this likely to perform? And you'd also do something like a price prediction to say, this is what, how much you're going to make this year, but this is how you might make the next year because your soils, soil health is going to improve. You use less, less chemicals. So in order to do that, you need these digital tools. You need good what if analysis. You need good models which don't really exist. So you need data, you need AI, you need all of this. But that's by itself not enough because in the short term, these farmers would see a loss. These farmers would be like, you know what? Compared to last year, I might not be making as much in the next season, even though after that, things might get better. A lot of these farmers are deep in loans. They are not, they need the money right now in order to, in order to get there, which is where I think policy has an important role to play as well. Either through all of this, uh, this talk around the carbon bank or, uh, companies trying to be more sustainable, like what I talked about. Microsoft talked about being carbon negative. One of the ways in which we're going to be carbon negative is by purchasing carbon credits from the right people who are going to be putting back carbon in soil. Maybe it is the growers. So there are there's part of getting farmers to adopt the sustainable agricultural practices. Part of it is a technology problem where data, AI, farm beats kind of tools would help. The other part of it, I think, is a policy problem. Of course, there are others as well. We need the right education. We need the right digital literacy part of it as well. But I think um, uh, this component of policy is going to be important to, to incentivize the farmers to do the right thing. Um, the next question is from Neil Gaekwad. Um, He says, I agree that data-driven agricultural technologies are critical. However, they are not a panacea to smallholder problems, both in the global north and south. The challenge is more socio-political as well. How do you ensure the technology doesn't amplify existing inequality and further harm, far, firm, further harm farmers when they don't have much say in the design process? This is, this is such a great question. Uh, and we need to be more inclusive. And I completely agree with this. Digital farming is just one of those tools that are going to make it happen, right? We're going to improve the lives of growers. And here our premise is just that, you know, the way we are thinking of digital tools are tools that will assist a grower make the right decision. There are other parts of it, like, for example, the, like it's not just about farming decisions, it's also about the entire supply chain and farmer data and to make sure that the data doesn't get in the hands of the wrong people. The data is used the right way to benefit the farmer. And we need representation from the farmer. We need, but well, that's also a challenge because as I mentioned, I talked about this digital literacy gap. Many of these growers are not aware about the challenges or, or about uh, what the benefits of data is. So we need to bring, do more of what we are doing in the US with, like for example, our partnerships with the FFA, with the Future Farmers of America, which is a direct connect with the farmers. These are the growers, these are their children and trying to get a connection with them. We need to do more of that for, uh, for the smallholder farmers. The way we are going around it at Microsoft is talking to the right stakeholders, talking to the government, talking to the farmer associations, the FPOs, talking to the World Bank, and understanding the challenges that exist and using that to guide our, uh, our decisions, our, our approach to the problem. Like, for example, uh, how do you even bring these decisions to what are these ICT tools uh, to get any of the advisories to the farmer? So the challenge is, suppose we want to convey uh, some information to the farmer. Like for example, when do you plant the seed? How do you convey this information? Is it a text message? Is it a missed call? Is it, uh, or is it something else? Is it a conversational AI method where a farmer can talk in their language, we can then use data to come back with the right answers. But these are again, things which we are working with local agencies, 
working with local, like in India, we did something with ICRISAT a few years back. We are doing something similar in Africa. We're working with the right local agencies to understand that. The part that is the hardest to, to, to answer the, the person who asked the question was, is, is educating the farmer to understand some of the benefits of all of this and the pitfalls of all of this. What are the potential security loopholes? Even we don't understand it, right? We, we use all of these technologies. We don't understand all of this completely either, but with any technology that we use. And this is a new technology for which we need to get more farmers involved. We are doing this well in the developed world. We need to do this better in the emerging markets. And we are working on it. We are trying to understand it. If anyone has thoughts, please uh, send me an email. I would love to just have a chat about this particular problem. Yeah. Thank you. So we are at the top of the hour. Um, we still have more questions. Ranveer has been gracious enough to stay for a few more minutes. So we're gonna go on with questions for just a few more minutes. Um, the next question is um, from James Lenz, who asks about related work and competitors. How does FarmBeats compare to the software advisory services from FieldView, Climate Corp in uh, California, with Encirca, DuPont, Iowa, Farm Business Network in Iowa, and Granular in San Francisco? No, this, these are great companies, and they're all partners of ours. Like you missed R7 from Lander Lakes. And so we, we work with all of these companies and the way they would be building. So all of these technologies you talked about with Encirca or FieldView or FBN, they're all farmer-facing products. FarmBeats is not farmer-facing. FarmBeats is a platform on top of which you can build a product like that and take it to the farmer. And we work like the, the one we've announced publicly is with Lander Lakes, and we'll be hearing more over the next few uh, over the next few years. But it, the the key thing there is, yeah, they are all partners of ours, not competitors. Uh, next question is from Federico Cifuentes Ortube. Um, says thank you for this interesting talk. Since different crops exist in different climates and different geographical terrains, like coffee, for example, at high elevations only in the tropics. Are there any unique barriers to deploy these data gathering systems in those environments? Yeah, it is, it is very, very unique to every, every, every part of the world for different reasons, right? That is a part of it is when you think of, uh, and like to, to the first point this uh, the Federico mentioned was there's so many crops right now in the US, we typically just focus on the top four broad acre crops, right? You know, like wheat, rice, soybean, and uh, uh, and we just and cotton, for example, right? That's what that's what our core focus is. But there are so many more crops, and like I think there are two hundred crops, and we need to first focus on all of them. And the methodologies could be different. Some of these some of these crops are in orchards. Uh, there could be different ways of growing crops, and that could lead to very interesting challenges. Like there was this almond farm where we were deploying our network in uh, in California, where these are trees, and then the same kind of sensors that would work really well for a corn farm in Illinois wouldn't work through these, through these canopies in California. So we had to come up with a different way of doing it. Same with a tea farm in Africa, where, which is again, tea farms are usually on hills where your connectivity solutions would look very different. Your data aggregation solutions would look different. It also depends on the backhaul. That is, you might not have a great backhaul connection to the cloud, in which case you need more to be done on the edge as opposed to on the cloud. In some cases, you need to be running offline. In other cases, the farmers might have different ways of collecting data. So this is very specific to that. Right now, the way we are addressing it is through the partners that we work with, uh, like, a, like we'll be working with a coffee company or with a tea company. We'll be working with them on the kind of challenges that comes up with say cocoa or for tea or for any of these crops. And that's the way we are extend, expanding the system. We start small with certain horticultural scenarios and broad acre crops, but then extending it to these other scenarios as and when we get the right partner to work with. At Microsoft, we are not an agriculture company, but we work with the agriculture companies to build solutions for them. Um, so maybe we'll take two more questions. Um, I'll ask one, then Carrie will ask one, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, the next question actually comes from the organizers, because we have been talking about the recent Suez Canal blockage. And since you talked about supply chain management, you wanted to get your thoughts on how you think um, the Suez Canal blockage has affected food supply chains ar around the world. Yeah, no, so this is, there's so much dependency right now, this worldwide dependency on food. This comes from different parts of the world. And the kind of dashboard that I, that I created with uh, Purdue, right, our team here, 
we created with Professor Lust's team in Purdue, we created this dashboard for the US for COVID. Now you need to extend that for these kind of scenarios so that in real time, you can know where the food is, where the food is blocked. And this is something which doesn't exist. This kind of a transparency in our supply chain doesn't exist right now. So we need to create more transparency, which means that we need some way for people to share data because one of the bigger problems here is that this data exists, but it exists with different components of the supply chain so that it doesn't get filtered to the end user. The fact that say uh, co coffee beans are blocked would affect say a company's coffee production, which would affect the consumer being able to get the right coffee or the price inflation that would, that would uh, result uh, uh, in the process. That kind of visibility doesn't exist. And like, for example, what we are seeing right now with the Suez Canal blockage, we saw a similar thing with the locust problem in Africa and India, COVID-19 resulted in disruptions. And all of this is something where we need a way to make our supply chain more transparent and more visible. And this doesn't exist right now. This is again, uh, this is a technology problem, also a business problem. How do you enable this trust between companies so that they feel more comfortable sharing some of the data that they might have? And final question is by Ephemio Sinis. Um, he asks, how could you generate pseudo data by using limited sensors available and limited computational power at the user end in order to make even more accurate adaptive predictions on a local level? And since the user might be offline for a long period of time, it could be the case that the server has absolutely no idea on whether the adaptive ML algorithm is working properly at the user level. How does one enable such robust predictions bringing together data from multiple farmers? So I don't know if you're a student or a, or a professor. If you're a student, why don't you come work with us? This is a problem that, that is top of our mind. If you're a faculty, would love to chat with you. Oh, this <laughs> is a student. Okay, yeah. You should, you should um, uh, yeah. I would love to talk to you more about the problems that we have and come help us out. Because this is one of the problems that, uh, that no one has addressed really. That how do you take, like I talked about the vision of Farm Beats being using data and AI to augment a farmer's knowledge. The farmer's knowledge is in their brain. How do you convert that, digitize it, so that the farmer doesn't always have to contextualize it? But these, these could be rules, these could be information that the farmer has been able, be enabling a grower to somehow incorporate this information in an ML model would be awesome. And then a lot of this, as you were saying, like using, it could be techniques such as a differential privacy method or using uh, some of the federated learning approaches that people are talking about. But we are exploring all of that. We don't have a solution to this yet. So a great question and we'd love to talk to you more and figure out how we can solve it. All right, um, let's wrap up. Thank you so much, Ranveer. That was a wonderful talk and a wonderful discussion. Um, great questions. Uh, we have several other questions that were sent to us. We will forward you the questions and, Thank you. and, and the names of the questioners as well. Um, uh, I also want to take uh, take this moment to thank our production team and invite them to re-video at this point. Thank you. None of this would be possible without the backend work of uh, Mitchell Oliver, Jingi Gu, Vinay Koshi, Gabe Malo, Jorge Rojas, Adrian Wong, and our ASL interpreters from the uh, University of Illinois address office, uh, Jason and uh, Laura. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, a recording of this talk, as well as links that are shared in our chat today will be posted to our website. Now, please join us next week again uh, for the next event with Suresh Venkata Subramanian from University of Utah. That's Wednesday, April 7th, same day, same day of the week. We hope to see you there. Bye.